draw the circle wide. It's never been easy for me to draw a circle freehand. I mean, a real circle. For one thing, I'm left-handed. I know that's no excuse, and I don't mean to offend left-handers who are supremely confident circle drawers. But if you're left-handed, you know how pencil marking can smear as your hand moves across the page. So I remember a lot of smeared circles in grade school. Plus, I don't happen to be very good at drawing in general. And I just can't figure this out except for the fact that I have put absolutely no effort or time into getting better at it. But I remember when I was asked to draw circles as a child in school, they always came out as sad little ovals. Circle-like, but not circles. Not real circles. And then I used a compass. And I remember that seemed quite magical to me, even though I, I ripped the paper with a sharp point and I'll blame it on the fact as I'm left-handed, as illogical as that may be. But I remember watching this shape form, finally a circle, a perfect circle, all points equidistant from the center. And I thought, I can do that. And I tried it freehand, all points equidistant from the center. I thought, all points equidistant but not my circles, they just didn't come out right. And we Unitarian Universalists like to get things right, don't we? We humans like to get things right. Uh, there's that part of our brain, I believe, and I'm no neuroscientist, uh, don't call on me for circle drawing or brain surgery, uh, but I do know that part of us that yearns to get things right. We have a picture in our head what we're after, and we're deeply satisfied when we achieve it, and deeply dissatisfied when we don't. If we're going to draw a circle, by gosh, we're going to draw a circle, and we know what a circle is supposed to look like, and if we're to draw the circle wider, well, you know, it made me wonder, if we're going to draw the circle wider, wouldn't we also have to grow it longer in order for it to remain a circle, all points equidistant in that? Well, bear with me for a few moments. What I'm saying is that drawing a circle wider is something of a messy proposition. Unpleasant, even if we are stuck on making the perfect circle. Have you ever seen the reorganization that takes place when we've gathered together in a circle? Let's say a congregational group or a gathering of some sort, and we've gathered in a circle, and then we realize we have more people attending than the circle holds, and we scooch our chairs, and we add chairs, and we realize that we now have a curvy, chaotic configuration that does not quite meet the circle standards because we can't see each other. We're maybe in a straight line that curves at the edges and sometimes a wavy line or a really wavy line, like if you end up having someone sitting behind you, you know, you know you're not in a circle. So we scooch some more and maybe we have to move a table to spread out further and might end up realizing the room does not lend itself to a perfect circle. So we, we need to just make it good enough, you know, to make it do, to make the less than perfect circle to hold the people who are present. But how do we do it? How do we go about drawing the circle wider? Do we sigh in frustration as we look at the new oblong configuration that was once our beautiful circle? Do we harumph as we skid the table across the floor? Do we resent the interruption of the scheduled activities? 
Are we visibly flabbergasted by the delay? Are we visibly upset when returning to the chair we were sitting in? We now find it occupied by a newcomer? And damn, the only reason it was open is because we were nice enough to get up and set out more chairs. And now we have to look for a new seat on one of those chairs we don't like sitting in. And sure enough, we actually end up sitting behind someone in this now deeply imperfect circle. How do we go about drawing the circle wider? I have probably been guilty of engaging that task as something less than graciousness at times, feeling all those things that I just mentioned and letting it show as we sought to get back to the matters at hand. But let me tell you, this making room, rearranging, drawing the circle wider, this is not an interruption or a delay of the work at hand. This is the work. Draw the circle wider or longer. Have it snake around immovable objects. Travel up and down over risers and find the shape it needs to take. Do whatever you need to do to allow more people to be included. Don't get hung up on the perfect circle. It's made up of people after all. Focus on the joy of welcoming, not the frustration of rearranging. And prepare for the work. In our pre-sermon reading, Leslie Hazelton shared with us that the Anso in Zen practice the circle, hand-drawn in a single fluid brushstroke, is often incomplete, left slightly open, as though an invitation to everything beyond it. We can cut down some of that frustration of rearranging if we prepare for the work. Any circle we make should have an opening. Sometimes we inadvertently, unintentionally close that circle, delighting in the construction of a perfect circle, but we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for inclusion, invitation. Draw the circle wide was a theme of the Pacific Southwest District Assembly in 2016 at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara and I took a few notes from that gathering. Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, now president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, then a presidential candidate, asked, how are we accountable to the people who haven't found us yet? And Reverend Allison Miller, who was also running for president of the association, asked, how must we adapt and change to welcome people who thirst for our healing message. This faith, said Reverend Rosemary Bratt McNabb, president of Star King School for the Ministry, this faith saves lives. Saves lives. I want to save our lives as citizens and human beings, she said. I want to save our lives as citizens and human beings. And that clear pur purpose has only grown more urgent over these past three years. We have something precious to offer in that endeavor. This face, I have seen it, saves lives. So how are we accountable to the people who haven't found us yet? How must we adapt and change to welcome people who thirst for our healing message? Draw the circle wider. Draw it wider still. And we need to leave an opening in our circle, right? Taking a lesson from the Anso in Zen practice. And that came to mind with our opening hymn this morning. Here we have gathered side by side, circle of kinship. Come and step inside. And just picturing this in my mind, I thought, 
how does one step inside a circle? When I imagine a circle, it's closed. The end of the line meets the point where it begins. But the circle we are talking about is different. It is indeed more of an ensemble. If someone is to step inside, there must be an opening, which also means a circle can be described as perpetually incomplete, which for those of us who want to get things right can lead to great anxiety, but what promise it holds? What promise if we are willing to adapt and change in order to welcome people who thirst for our healing message. What promise that we leave an opening in our circle, set out an open chair, or two, or three, even give up our choice seat and find another among the newly imperfect curves of inclusion that we have created so that all have a place. I have watched people enter a room and encounter a closed circle. And even though people graciously scooch and make room and provide a chair, there's an uncomfortable, unintentional message that we didn't expect you to be here and now we must move, must open up the circle, must be inconvenienced in order to accommodate your unexpected arrival. And that initial moment and the feelings it carries can never be reclaimed. We could have prepared an invitation to join, an opening in the circle, an empty chair, but instead we've given the feeling that we are politely accommodating an intrusion. And now, God forbid, the near perfection of our circle is ruined as you can't just get everybody to see exactly how they should move to maintain geometric purity. But the beauty of the Zen circle, the beauty of the circle we invoke when we encourage ourselves to draw the circle wider, the beauty of that circle lies precisely, or more precisely, imprecisely, in its imperfection. Draw the circle wide. Draw the circle wider than what we expect as necessary, each and every circle we create. May we leave an opening in every circle we create as an invitation. May we add a chair or two or whatever, whenever we be gather together. May we draw on the wide side of the brain, the side that knows that inviting in, making room, offering welcome, changing our shape is never an interruption or delay of what we do. It is what we do. It is central. Rather, let us practice a sacred flexibility that allows us to give up our geometric purity when it comes to our circles, so that we are unafraid to draw them wider, stretch them longer, and find joy in the task of rearranging. Let us be fearless in our willingness to make new shapes, so that we may be accountable to people who have not found us yet, so that we may welcome those who thirst for our healing message so that we may engage with our people and our partners the work before us to save our lives as citizens and human beings. And finally, from Leslie Hazelton again, a perfect circle is uninteresting. A closed system containing nothing while an imperfect one vibrates with warmth, it invites us into the moment of its creation. It is open, human, fallible. An expression, that is, 
of soul. May it be so.